I am a teacher here and I must tell you that I had the privilege of being mentored and trained by some of the greatest people. The IIT system to which I came after doing my graduation in Indore University actually changed a whole lot of my thinking. I was a reasonably good student at Indore. I was also on the merit list. But I had figured out how to crack the university exam system. So after first year which I, where I studied very hard, I learned that there are options in every paper. Solve any six out of ten questions. Do you still have that? Yes. yes. Uh, so sad. <laughs> because what it resulted in is I started studying only 60% of the syllabus, still scoring 85% marks. So very recently when I wanted to learn machine learning and AI, and I told my colleague Dr. Sunita Saragi that can I attend her class? She was excited. She sent me a book. I read first 15, 20 pages were simple. And then suddenly probability and statistics started, which I had given up in option in my third year. <laughs> so I politely told her I will attend next year. That's what happens when you have so many options. Actually, in the third year, I also figured out that most people repeated questions from alternate years. Now, that means I had to study much less still. But when I came here, the situation was completely different. And that is where I realized the, the difference. Here, teachers challenge every student in every aspect, and students don't mind getting challenged. And that's a very fundamental difference here. IITs have not fallen from sky. And people who run IITs are exactly the same people, the same stock, who run other institutions. It is just the ethos and chemistry here is different. And I hope you had some glimpse of that. Of course, you seem to be working in extended COVID time. I'm told you're working uh, offline. So which means you physically come to the labs here and work. Ah, that's a good thing to do. All right. So I've been asked by Kavi and Professor Kavi Arya to speak on professional and personal ethics. I am quite amused because ethics is also introduced as a course in some universities. Do you have a course or paper on ethics? You have? Wonderful. I am still looking desperately for somebody who has become very ethical after succeed, successfully doing that paper. You see, uh, the, the story which the director of uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy where they train IS officers, I had gone to give a invited talk there and he was sharing with me the problem that they have even within the IS calendar. So they also have a paper in ethics and he said sir from my batch the person who scored maximum marks in that paper was known to be the most unethical person in the batch. <laughs> so marks in exams have unfortunately not always have to do something with your not just knowledge, but imbibing that knowledge. Ethics, that's why the title that I've chosen is that it's a slippery path, but a path which we must somehow follow for lifelong success. And there is no shortcut to it. It has to be, she mentioned that I proudly say that teaching is not my profession, but it's a, it's a dharma. Dharma is not translated as religion, which is wrongly done by the English language enthusiasts. Dharma in India is way of life. So every individual in whichever profession that individual is, has to follow a good way of life, which is well defined. Whether you are a student, whether I'm a teacher. So what is the teacher's way of life? There are several things. Fundamental motto is relate, connect and motivate. That's the only job the teacher can do. It is stupid to assume that teacher gives knowledge. Particularly today when knowledge is available on internet, far more easier than listening to a teacher who may make mistakes. The teacher's job is actually to ensure that every student in the class spends maximum amount of quality time in that subject so that the student learns. Knowledge is never transferred from one mind to another. If it was a transferable commodity, 
then as a teacher of more than 50 years, all the knowledge would have been transferred and I should be zero. That doesn't happen. Knowledge has to be generated in every mind. And it gets generated when people think, when they spend quality time doing it and so on. But while you are studying this, you are also preparing yourself for a professional life. And in the professional life, ethics remains extremely important. So first, some few things about professional ethics, because that is what you will be. Certain things which actually are not considered part of core ethics, but are extremely important in normal day-to-day -day life, are things like courtesy, things like commitment to your colleagues, things like commitment to your work. Work comes first and then comes anything else. Somehow these things are not specifically taught. But our students everywhere in the world are smart enough to figure these things out. And they actually adopt many of these. It so happens that we often tend to emulate those who are more experienced and senior to us. So we do, for example, try to emulate teachers. But sometimes we forget that teachers are also human beings. They are not infallible. They may make mistakes. So you have to be very discerning. And you have to actually find out what are the things which a teacher does right and what are the things which a teacher does not do right. And this is not new. I don't know how many of you have ever read Upanishada. There is one particular Upanishad, Taittiri Upanishad, where a particular lesson is almost like a convocation address. The Upanishads were written 4,000 years ago. And when the teacher says Tathastu to a student who has studied in the ashram and is going back, among several things that the teacher tells the student, like Satyam Vada, Dharmam Chara, etc., he reminds the student, students generally are asked to follow whatever their teacher's lives are. But the teacher during this final convocation address says, Yani anavadhyani karmani, tani sevitavyani no itarani. Only those acts of mind which are blemishless follow those, nothing else. This is a great admission by a senior teacher saying that, look, I may be good, but I have maybe made mistakes. Perhaps I am not doing everything right. So be discerning. But follow all the good things. And if you combine all the teachers who have ever taught you, and collect all the good things from each one, you don't need to look anywhere else. In fact, I have, a, I have a theory which says that if you pick up 10 people randomly from any collection, 10 friends, for example, and make two lists. In one list, you write all the characteristics of that individual which are likable. Like somebody is very punctual, somebody is very polite. You, you write down. Now you take another sheet and write those characteristics of the same ten people which are not like him. So somebody is very arrogant, somebody comes always late. You know, a 8.30 class on the 1st of January starts at 8.30 sharp, not at 8.31. That is the tradition which makes IIT different from other institutions. So I was sadly surprised that 4.30 did not mean 4.30 to all of you. I stay outside. I came first, I went to my office, I instructed my assistant to send some mails because I have to travel again. But still I was here at 4.29. Not all of you were here at 4.29. Remember this. These are very small things. But my dear friends, professional ethics consists of small things only. Big things will automatically follow. So this penchant for discipline, time management. And time management is the heart of everything that you do. Later on when you become professional, you will be given certain time to do a certain task. Unless you plan, you may not be able to finish in time. And it's not good to finish in time, it's good to finish ahead of time. You take small things as attending classes, as 
imbuing discipline in you as understanding time management as fundamentals of professional life but there are two or three things which would actually make you a great professional one is courtesy the other is commitment and the third is concern so let me tell you a story which I, an incident which happened in my life and although i was aware of the importance of these things but first hand what should i say experience from a great guy all of you have heard of dr abdul kalam right so this happened when he was not the president of india he was still the chief of drdo great guy i was then doing a project on uh, building a maintenance training simulator for light combat aircraft the imported simulator would cost about a crore and half and we are sure that we can make it in 30 35 lakh rupees here so we are working on it dr kota harinarayan was the program director was very happy with it and uh, kalam visited iit bombay one day so i immediately said he must meet my 15 20 project staff members who are working with me went to the director's office they said no his program is completely chalked out so i said i just need him to spend 15 minutes no time so can i talk to his personal secretary i would like to get an appointment in the evening no 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 the personal secretary has announced that dr kalam has to take early morning 5 o'clock flight so absolutely no schedule after evening then i went through his schedule he was moving from one lab to another and the farthest he had to travel was a lab Uh, behind uh, the old computer science math department building to the aerospace building so then i approached the organizer said let me drive him from here to there he said, what will you get i said i'll get 2 minutes with him we we'll talked to him so when i went there i was waiting outside the lab after the lab visit finished he came out and i was introduced to him saying dr kalam this professor will be your chauffeur for the next drive to he smiled shook hands and we walked i had a old ricketty fiat then so he had a gunman by the way even then security guard so i opened the rear door and requested him to come in he must have noticed that there was no driver in the driver seat and therefore he must have quickly realized that i am going to drive myself so what he did is he sort of pushed me aside held the door and asked the gunman to sit inside and he came opened the front door and sat next to me can you imagine that he was a great man even then chief of drdo and i was a young teacher but that is courtesy that is extraordinary courtesy when i was driving or talking i was telling him sir i want you to visit my lab uh, but i am told and then i told him i am working on this maintenance training so yes 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 uh, dr kota rinaran has told me you are doing something marvelous work in electronic system design so i would be happy to come so i said but sir i did not get any slot of yours he said then he turns to me all while we are driving okay he says do your people work in the night I said of course they do this is iit bombay then he smiled he said come to guest house at 10 o'clock in the night i was horrified i said but sir your personal secretary has said that you have a 5 o'clock right to catch and you're not absolutely not giving any appointments afterwards he smiled and said he sleeps at 9:45 <laughs> <laughs> but his desire his desire to relate to people who were doing something indigenously was so great that uh, i mean then i realized what what the kalami when i came back very happy i announced it to my team that dr kalam is visiting us the news spread like wildfire how did fatak manage an appointment with kalam the night at 10 o'clock there were two of my colleagues professor zuzer wasi and late professor arun chandorkar who were working on microelectronics there was no nano electronics back then this is late 80 story and they had actually developed an equipment for microelectronics lab which if imported would have cost about 75 lakhs they had built it in 15 lakhs it was a working 
and they were as keen that dr kalam should see it because they knew his his passion for indigenous development so chandur called me and says fatak uh, uh, he can you bring him to my lab i said how can i uh, I, i mean i i he, please remember he has still to catch a morning 5 o'clock flight but i said that if you come to my lab at 10:20 he will finish in about 20 25 minutes and then you can request him then it's up to you and him he visited our lab and i tell you the way he would say simple things but so impactful my entire team was working for next 6 months like zombies that was the power of his his passion at 10 20 they come and i introduce them saying sir these are my colleagues and uh, Chandrakar started telling about the microelectronics lab. Yeah, yeah, I have heard of it from Dr. Saraswat, some other person here. Sir, we want you to visit very briefly. He smiled and said, "I don't mind as long as Professor Fatak is ready to chauffeur me to your lab." <laughs> and so he went back to the guest house at quarter to eleven, eleven o'clock in the night. And he must have slept for two hours or three hours like that. But so. please understand why he did all that he need not have done any one of those things he was actually approving projects to be done he was allocating funds etc and he knew exactly who in india is doing useful work and all. but he wanted he cared he cared for people because he knew it is people who make things now the story might sound unrelated but i believe genuinely that this has taught me and this would teach anybody a very fundamental lesson in professional ethics your passion your commitment your care and your courtesy never ever forget them wherever you are don't ever become exceptionally proud of your achievements all of you are very capable people and each one of you will rise very high but the moment you let that air go into your head oh i am this or i am that etc etc don't forget what arya chanakya said again thousands of years ago ki apne kisi hunar ko itna bada mat samajhna don't ever think that you are so great because don't forget that a large stone if it falls in water it sinks because of its own weight so don't become too heavy with that weight be always light and nimble do good things but do them because a you are capable please understand one thing very clearly your hard work is yours your sincerity is yours but your basic intellectual capability comes from genetic genetics you have done nothing to get that how you use that capability for benefit of the world and for of course your benefit and everybody's benefit is what is your achievement don't ever forget that achieve great things but achieving them ethically in the professional life you progress following some simple things as i said i mean there are so many other things about professional ethics but i thought i will today emphasize only these few things which i regard as fundamental courtesy we talk so much of western world but you know they have three simple words which they use extensively and meaningfully one is to say please second is to say thank you and third is to say sorry we say neither of them we don't mean any disrespect when we interact with people but we don't explicitly say this ever it's not in our psyche it's not in our genre i believe these are important things these are simple things but they convey your real intention more easily and more quickly to others my suggestion is because you are going to be global citizens please learn to adopt this as early as possible start practicing it even when you want to tell a small thing your friend so in my indoor style i would say abhi wo kitab de that is not the correct style because you are actually treating him as friend he doesn't mind because he also speaks to you like this will you please give me that book it's far more courteous now it's not easy to make that switch but it's important to do that 
Similarly, if somebody does something good for you, so do we say thank you explicitly? No. Sometimes our behavior indicates that we are extremely thankful. But that has to be understood by the other person. If the other person is also Indian like us, he or she will understand. The rest of the world may not. And sorry we rarely say. You know why? Because genuinely we are never sorry. It is extremely difficult to accept that I made the mistake. It's very easy to say he made the mistake or he made the mistake or he made the mistake. I mean, take the, the general uh, uh, phenomena that you observe. You walk on the streets and you see potholes. Well, who is responsible? The municipal corporation. If something is not working in your state, the chief minister is responsible. The nation is going to dog, the prime minister is important. Things are not happening in the world, God is responsible. But I am not responsible for anything. Now, that aloofness is a good thing, but running away from responsibility is not good. Anything and everything around you that is not happening correctly, you must take it as your personal responsibility. And do something about it if you can. Don't quietly accept what it is. That is also a part of the professional ethics that you should follow, in my opinion. About personal ethics, they are not completely untwined from professional ethics, but there are a few personal ethics which actually are very, very critical in our lives. So again, let me tell you a couple of stories. Both relate to fiduciary responsibility. Do you understand what a fiduciary responsibility means? Fiduciary means things to do with money. Now, usually we spend our money, we are careful with our money. Are we as careful as we are about our own money when we are spending somebody else's money? Particularly when we are spending public money or money that is being given to us by somebody else for doing something? Are we as careful? Do we ensure that the money that I earn with my hard work is my money and no money is my money other than that? Do we ensure that? Mostly yes, but sometimes we don't. You must be participating in several events which are organized in your institutions. Okay. I do not know how it is in your individual colleges, but whatever, wherever I have seen, an event is well done, students work extremely well, etc., etc., but accounts never get settled in time. Because somebody has sloppily forgotten to take a bill, or somebody has taken a bill and lost it, or somebody is smart enough to say, ye se bil mana ke paisa nikal leta hun. These are temptations that will happen here. And that is why fiduciary responsibility is an absolutely important response. So, let me tell you two incidents which, which happened in my own life I learned. This is in 70s, I had visited the Nagpur for the marriage of a friend of mine. There's an overnight train, which reached Nagpur early morning, 5 o'clock. It was December, it was very cold. And those days, you had cycle rickshaws near the station. So I was staying with another friend. I had the address and I told that rickshawala. We negotiated the fare. And he says, Ek rupiah lagega. And TK, whatever. He took me there. I gave him a 10 rupee note and he says, I don't have any change. Savere savere chiller So then he says, you're going to stay here in this house, right? So go and get a rupee from them. I said, have a heart, I'm visiting them for the first time. And it looks so funny that a guest comes and says, do you have one rupee? <laughs> so I said, I won't do that. Then he says, all right, you give me some time. Whenever I get change, I will come and give you the return. I said, fine. I gave him the 10 rupee note, went inside. I was welcomed, I freshened up, I had breakfast. And I was looking at the door, there was no knock or anything like that. So after about one hour, my friend's younger brother, Praful, Puffy, I was called, said, why are you looking at the door? And I said, are you wo rickshaw wale ko 10 rupiya diya hai, you are supposed to return my change. And he said, what? So, do you have his rickshaw number? I said, no. So, I said, is he mad? He knows that you have come for some marriage ceremony. You will go back. 
why on earth he should come back to return those nine rupees? I mean, so I said, no. I, I looked at his face and it looked as if he will come back. He says, no, unlikely. Fine. We left it at that. Two more hours passed, three more hours passed. And then around lunch time, there was a knock on the door. And this rickshawla standing, asking the person who opened the door, saying, you have some guests visiting, I have to return these nine rupees. I came in between and I saw him, said hello. And he says, I am very sorry, sir. But when I left you, I got a kiray, I got a fare of a lady who was pregnant and had to be taken to a hospital, which is about seven kilometers from. So I took her there. And then I was busy moving around. I did not get any fare to come on this side. And I didn't want to lose my business. So that is why I got delayed. He apologized and gave those nine rupees. Can you imagine? He's an illiterate rickshawala. He's not as educated as any one of us. But he had this fundamental ethics that whatever he has worked for, he has earned, is his. And nothing else is his. And even five hours later, he had the courtesy to come back all the way to return those nine rupees. I have learned a very important lesson from this incident. I hope you will remember this in your lives. Be absolutely clear in your life that whatever you earn is yours. And whatever is somebody else's, you will never take. Wherever possible, you will return it. Wherever not possible, you will give it to lost and found or to police or whatever it is. But it's not yours. Now, the temptation to keep some money in the pocket is so bad. That's why I call this path a slippery path. And it doesn't matter even if you sleep once or twice, but as long as you carefully remember. There is another incident that happened many years later about the way you should treat public money as carefully as you treat your own money. I used to play competitive chess in those days and there was a tournament in Mumbai and there was a player from Vidarbha called Abdul Jabbar. He was the national champion of the fast chess, chess the national B champion, the national A player. I had the privilege of playing a game with him in the tournament and had the privilege of getting completely wiped out from the board. It was very funny, I mean, those of you who play chess, I said, I'm playing against a strong player, so let me exchange pieces. So he would move his bishop somewhere, I'll put my bishop there. But instead of capturing and exchanging the bishop, he will take this bishop back. I put knight against his knight, he will take that knight back. And I said, Abhi, how do I proceed? And after some eight or ten moves, I found that all the pieces which he supposedly had taken back had assembled very nicely for a great attack on my king. And my pieces were chasing those pieces elsewhere. No wonder with a few more moves I had to resign. He's a great player. But he came from a very humble Jula family. He had studied probably up to fifth or sixth grade. He could not write English. And in those days in chess tournaments you had to write. So you had to say pawn, king, four, so P, K, etc. These, these. So he studied those letters how to write. And numbers one to eight. I don't think he ever learned how to write English 9. It's not necessary in chess. Now, he, he used to wear, uh, I still remember, canvas shoes without socks. And he had sort of a khaki color uh, uh, pant or pajama type thing and a coat. And so after one of the rounds, we were walking back from in that Matunga hall to the station and uh, the Maharashtra Chess Association Secretary, Mr. Sakharkar, was with us. And Abdul Jabbar asked him, Sakharkar sahab, Jandu Pharmaceuticals, kon si bus jati? which bus goes to Jandu Pharmaceuticals? Jandu Pharmaceuticals was a company in Mumbai, in Parer, where they had given the canteen of that Jandu Pharmaceuticals after the closure of the normal day's work, 5 o'clock onwards, to Bombay Chess Association. So Bombay Chess Association had an office there. How do you want to go there? He says, no, I have to give them some papers of Vidarbha Chess Association and I have to collect some certificates or something. Zakhakar said, oh, that's official work. So go in a taxi. And you know what Jabbar said? 
साहब मैं अपने काम के लिए कभी टैक्सी में नहीं बैठता आई डोंट सिट इन अ टैक्सी इवन फॉर माय ओन पर्सनल वर्क एवर हाउ कैन आई स्पेंड एसोसिएशन मनी टू ट्रैवल इन अ टैक्सी एंड हाउ मेनी ग्रोन अप एजुकेटेड हाई प्रोफाइल पीपल यू नो हु विल नॉट यूज the official endorsed entitlement which is given by their office for themselves very happily without realizing that if it came to them will they spend money from their own pocket to do it this is a eye opener so i decided from that day that i i used to be invited as guests they would pay the fare they'll put up in, in some hotel or something like that so i said that <coughs> how do i imbibe this philosophy in me so i said i must attend one or two conferences every year entirely at my cost but using exactly the same privileges that i would otherwise get from the government as entire and when i come back and i feel that there is no pinch this is okay then and only then i am entitled to be hosted by others not otherwise so this is a very peculiar decision so i I remember the first such conference I attended was the Computer Society of India conference. I flew there. I stayed in a five-star hotel. I came back, and the bills came back with me, of course. My wife saw them and said, "Are you not applying for reimbursement?" Then sheepishly I told her that uh, uh, I'm I'm trying to experiment and practice that I should be able to spend money from my own pocket for doing these things. she says deepak are you telling me that you are practicing ethics at my cost because she regarded all the money that i earned to be her money and i again she peacefully said yes you know what she told me she says, this is fine but next time you do that you take me with you because anyway you are spending my money so after the conference we'll stay for a couple of days you show me around and come back we have been doing that since 1974 75 every year till today now we travel business class we stay in five star hotels but we spend money from our own pocket moral of the story is that you have to learn to treat public money as carefully as you would treat your own money so please remember even in your student days when you attend or when you participate in organizing any event there will be a lot of expenditure you will have to purchase things you will have to travel you will do some be very careful with the money that you spend negotiate with the other party as hard as you would negotiate for your own work be careful that public has given you money because they trust you that you spend it wisely so do that that's part of the fiduciary responsibility and of course fiduciary responsibility must not only be exercised but must also be seen a very small incident happened i had a colleague professor sina in physics department he was warden of hostel 7 in those days the food in hostel 1 where i lived as my master student uh, and hostel 7 were considered good food now in one summer i found him quite often visiting hostel 1 and because computer science department was that side i used to come from that road and so i once asked him kya sina sahab yahan kyu aaye so he he told me that he comes here for his lunch and dinner then i said it's very funny you are warden of hostel 7 and hostel 7 food is also great and i know for sure that you go to hostel 7 at least once a day so why don't you eat there <clears throat> and you know what he told me in hindi he said fatak sahab wahan khana khate hue sab dekh lenge paise dete hue koi nahi dekhega a whole lot of people will see me that i am eating there but nobody will see me paying so many of the students in hostel 7 might presume wrongly that because he is a warden he is eating free here and there that kind of discipline and ethics that is fiduciary responsibility in that you i think we all have to learn to practice this there is no there is no shortcut to it why i call ethics is a slippery game is i've just given you some couple of incidents instances of what i think are good practices but there will be temptations throughout your professional lives 
there will be temptations throughout your personal life to cut corners somewhere. You know, individually, as human beings, as, as what you can say, our animal instinct is to be very selfish. It is natural, there's nothing wrong like that. Preserving the self or helping the self is a, the greatest urge. But human values get superimposed on that urge. And that is where we call people as educated people, as good people. And you would like to be remembered later in posterity as a person, as a good person. And nobody should be able to say ki thoda uske character pe blot hai, nahi hona chahiye. Or nahi hoga if you are careful, very, very careful throughout your lives. Whether you are a student, later on you are a professional, whatever it is. Few years ago when I was teaching the, a course in effective communication here, uh, my colleague, Professor Viren, told me that, why don't you tell people the stories of your... So I, I recorded those. Uh, they are in a Google Drive, so I can send you a link. And I will also send you the link to the YouTube video because that is actually... Uh, I have been giving those talks even earlier, but in 2012, I had really prepared hard. And that talk went well, the passing out students. In fact, uh, some of the parents of those students who were also IITians listened to that and wrote to me saying, Patak, you should have given this talk to us when we were students there. So it turned out to be good. I'll send you a link if you are interested to do that. But what I would like you to do, more important than anything else, is you look at these stories, all right. But I am sure that in your own individual lives, some incidences must have happened which would have left an impression on you. Whether your interaction with someone, maybe completely unknown, maybe somebody from family, maybe somebody friend, uh, some friend of yours or whatever, where that incident told you that there is something remarkably nice about this behavior. And you would have liked that. Now, you would have forgotten that instance. Because so many incidents happens in our, happen in our life that we don't care for. My humble suggestion to you is write down one such story. The very act of painting it down will actually help you remember that story, remember that incident. And believe me, you will again feel that impact on you. And if it is okay with you, share that story with others, like I am sharing those stories. It helps because, you see, good things stated somewhere alone are not enough. We, we need to know about them and we need to develop an urge to practice those good things. Ethics is a way of life. As I said, there is a dharma when you are a student, there is a dharma when you are a professional, and when you follow that dharma, you become great. You become a great human, you become a great professional, you become a great leader. Abdul Kalam did not become great overnight. You know his life, right? Came from a family of uh, fishermen and others and he struggled all through. But worked hard. But never let... You know, DRDO, many of you may not be aware, the official procedures of spending money on approved projects, the funds have been approved, is so hard that you will get frustrated at times. And yet throughout his life, he did not miss a single rule to be followed, whatever it is. It takes four times more work, all right, I will do four times more work, but I will follow the rule. So, life is difficult if you follow rules. It's much easier to break it. And we are not disciplined enough. Take social discipline, for example. How many people stop at the red light in traffic? Always. Simple thing. I thought that that is the way life works. Uh, till I started going out, till 1994, I did not leave the country because I had this fancy notion that Unless I serve the nation for 20 years, I should not leave the shores. Uh, then I did not have time. But in 94, I went to US, I saw the world. In 95, I was attending a conference in Hawaii. 
we were returning in a bus, some 10 or 15 participants uh, to the airport, morning 3 o'clock. Now there is a crossroad. The Maui Island where we were staying, that particular part was a plain part. So when the bus stopped suddenly, because there was a red light, we could see that there was, for miles together, there was no other vehicle. And uh, one of the senior persons from Indian contingent uh, told the driver, oh, there is nobody else, we can go. He turned, smiled and said, I have not stopped because there is traffic or not. I have stopped because there is a red light. And that is discipline. At 2.30 in the morning, there is no traffic. If the light is red, I stop till it becomes green. Do we practice that? We don't because nobody else does. And we think it is everywhere. My humble suggestion is, you start following it. And you don't care whether others follow it or not. It's very difficult because people will laugh at you. Particularly if you are driving or going in a city like Pune, uh, where people who want to turn right always travel on the left side of the road. <laughs> they suddenly come like this. But I think some fundamental parts of social discipline should be ingrained in all of us as a part of our professional and personal ethics. Otherwise, we don't realize it, but we are making life miserable for everyone else around. So, discipline and following up on that discipline is, I think, very, very fundamental. I would suggest that you also have a long life and you would like to live every instance of your life as a very happy instance. That you should be very happy with it. There is one simple test that I do. Every day morning when you get up, go to the mirror and look into the mirror. And if you can look at the face in the mirror with your eyes straight, focused on that eyes, then you are alright. But if something has happened, something has been done by you which is not correct, your own heart will tell you and your eyes will go down. If that happens, re-examine yourself here. Don't make that mistake. I think that's a very good uh, acid test of ethics. Nothing else is required. And along with that, learn one more thing. It's not really part of ethics, but part of life. You know, whenever there are failures, we tend to become depressed. This is natural. But failures will happen in life and they will hurt. But if you keep mulling over that hurt, all that happens is you lose more time in life. See, time is a commodity which is a one-way traffic. So, that's why I, I tell people that the, the three letters which I've expanded, uh, which form the word dew, you have seen dew drops, they look so beautiful on petals in the morning, winter morning, etc. But for me, D, E and W means something special. D means dream big. Dr. Abdul Kalam also stated that, always. Because your dreams will limit your achievements. Not that you will always achieve large dreams, but you will try harder. So D should stand for dreaming big. E stands for enjoying life. Enjoy every instance of your life because that instance will never come back again. So what are you doing? You are studying, you are playing a game, you are seeing a movie, you are arguing with your friend, you are fighting your mother with your mother. Fighting with parents is, should, is always exciting. <laughs> so you, you can actually... But enjoy everything that you do. Everything. Because that instance will never come back. So E is for enjoying life. And W is for working hard, because otherwise you cannot create history. So dream big, enjoy life and work hard. And believe me, that will implicitly solve your ethical problems and dilemmas for all your life. Because you will not be able to enjoy every instance if you have done something wrong in any instance prior to that. And as I was telling you, some, some things will not work to your liking. Okay. So failures will hurt, but don't spend any time mulling over those failures. I have learned it the hard way. Like all of you, I also have faced hard times in life. But what I have learned is, I, I feel desperate, I cry to myself. But when I sleep in the night, 
when I get up next morning, I look at the sun and say, ah, there is a new sun. And let this new sun bring new life in me. So forget whatever are your failures in not more than 24 hours. Every extra hour that you spend in still feeling hurt, you're wasting a great opportunity that life has given. Because every instance is important. So, as I said, failures will be there, but learn to recover fast. All of you are engineering students, right? So you're familiar with exponential function. So you know the impulse response. Large impulse comes, that's like a failure. But a good stable system, what happens? Exponentially, zoom, it comes down to back to normal. That should how your life be. So, first order, fantastic control system is what you should build in yourself. So one observation, like one, like you know, I quite hear this quite often that you know the government jobs that is there. There is a lot of uh, you know corruption problem that is there. Uh, it's quite like it's in the system. Um, so I'm not exactly like I'm aiming to go in that direction, but like uh, like just as an example, there is a lot of other places where like you know uh, if you don't be with the uh, people who are with higher power. There's a lot of, uh, you know, shoving you here and there and uh, destroying you and all. Uh, so, like, how do you address that? Because that's a big trouble. Corruption is a systemic problem and it exists everywhere in the world. The temptation to make money out of some power or authority that has been given to me, but instead of being happy with the salary that I get, try to make money out of that power, is the root cause. And this temptation cannot be removed anyway. By the way, in India, we do have a lot larger corruption. Some countries like Indonesia, etc., they have made it official. So you can actually give a bribe with a check. We have not reached that level of achievement yet. But but corruption is there in every nook and corner of the world. As long as this temptation is there. Now, so again, come back to this ethics. Somehow, our entire education system has definitely succeeded in making people literate. But are they educated truly is something that I wonder sometimes. So, that is a, that is a problem. However, I can tell you with not only my personal experience, but the experience of a whole lot of people whom I know, they can steadfastly continue to remain absolutely indisputably in um, uncorrupt. Absolutely. I, I'll tell you one simple incident. I was, my parents were staying in Ludhiana at that time. And I was coming back. Uh, uh, I had a first class ticket, but I had no reservation. So, I went inside. There were apparently seats available, berths available. But uh, one attendant came to me and said, you give him 50 rupees and the TC will give you a berth. Why should I give 50 rupees? I said, will he give receipt for 50 rupees? Because the reservation charges for a berth then was some 14 rupees 50 paisa or something. So I said, 14 rupees 50 paisa is what? Is. He, he said, no, you will get a receipt only for 14.50. I said, I'll give you 14.50. He says, then you will not get birth. I said, this is fine. So the TC came actually, the train was moving. TC came and saw me. He again asked that attendant to meet me. The attendant met me. I said, no, I will not give. Then, Sir, you are going to Mumbai. How will you travel? I said, I will, don't worry. The third time when the TC came, he saw that I was sitting on the floor. I had a Times of India newspaper, so I had spread that paper. And I was, I was sitting like a Ganpati there, Aram Singh. And uh, then the TC could not hold himself. He said, Kya sahab aap aise jaoge? Will you go like that? So I said, ah, if you, there is no birth available uh, for the normal official rate for which the birth should be available, then I'll go like this, what else birth? Then he did like this and said, okay, go to some cabin B4 or some such thing. So you see, if you persist, then the question is who blinks first? 
Now, I contemplated a lot on this incident. Suppose I had an old mother with me or an old uncle with me. Would I have shown the same resilience? I'm not so sure. Because I, I would be terribly worried about my father's comfort. At an old age, if I have to carry him, how do I do that? Who knows? I would have been tempted to pay him 50 rupees. So, things are relative. But, you know, if it happens once in a while, because the circumstances, that is different than making it a routine affair. So, don't forget that when we say the system is corrupt, very often, without realizing it, we become part of that corruption. That should be avoided. But other than that, we just have to hope that 130 crore people will get better educated one day, not just literate. That's all. So, there was some guy saying that to become uh, successful in life, you should be 90% good and 10% bad. So, what is your take on this? I don't agree with the 10% bad thing. But perhaps what is meant is, 10% harsh. Take for example your professional life. There will be occasions, if you are 100% good, then you will never be critical of any wrong thing that happens around you. Particularly if your friend does something wrong, you will hesitate in criticizing. This is the typical Indian cycle. We think that is not good friendship. Actually, exact opposite should happen. If I am your good friend, my first duty is to tell you that, look, buddy, you are not doing this thing right. Correct yourself. This is a mistake. I must shout at you. I should support you in everything else, but if you make a mistake. If I don't tell you that you have made a mistake, as in your friend, will your enemy come and tell you ever? So, we believe that our notion of 100% good is sometimes very wishy-washy. It's not very useful. So you have to be harsh. You have to be critical when something is done wrongly. But being critical does not mean you lose your courtesy or you lose your temper. So I think that 90% good, I like that idea. I don't know about the percentage. But 10% harshness when it is required without losing your cool, without getting affected. Because if you act out of anger, then what you do becomes bad. But you act because it is required to be acted upon and you act coolly, then it's not bad. It's, it may be harsh. So I would interpret that 10% as, as the harshness. This saying that was walking up, that was, who was walking across the riverside. So he saw a scorpion was drowning in the water. Uh, and the saint went and like tried to grab the scorpion and uh, bit his hand. And he slipped and then again he tried to take him up and, and then a guy who was on looking this incident, he says that, uh, he, like, are you a fool? Why are you doing this? He's biting your hand, but yet you try to help him again. And then the saint, the saint replies that the, if the scorpion is not willing to give up his uh, bad attitude, why should I give up my good attitude? Scorpion is following his dharma, which is biting everybody then I must follow my dharma of helping everybody. But that's why he was a saint. We all are mortals. We are not unfortunately saints. So sometimes uh, we will actually hit the scorpion or throw it away or whatever it is. But the moral of this story is very important. To my mind, the moral of this story is no matter who else behaves in whichever fashion, I will still have my behavior in an exemplary fashion only, no matter what other. I would learn this from this. Do not try to describe something as good and something as bad. Because the moment you make that classification in your mind, you start putting labels on the behavior of everyone around you. I personally don't believe that they are bad people. I also personally don't believe that there are all people are good. People are people. Each of us has our own individual characteristic, individual way of life. The commonality is displayed in a society that is where precisely the 
basic ethics comes in. That if ethical norms are followed by everyone, then that is the common theme. But the way people will behave will be different. As I said, somebody will get very angry, somebody will become very arrogant, somebody will be, it's okay, you have to deal with uh, But don't lose your dharma, don't lose your sight of what is good. I think that's the only thing we can take off. And please try to avoid being judgmental. Because when we are judgmental, it is extremely difficult to set up a very clean, healthy and happy relationship with anyone. Happens in family, happens with friends, happens everywhere. We often are very quickly judgmental. That's a problem with the Indian side. So if some behavior you notice like a scorpion, just remember that only a scorpion will do that thing repeatedly, but a human being will not. See, if a human being does some nasty thing, it's not that the person is perpetually nasty. Might be circumstance. But we can debate on this endlessly. There is, there is no final or correct answer to any such. But I have learned one thing that trying to define something as good and something as bad is, is not a good thing. Because it, <coughs> that process of classifying and thinking actually haunts you. And you lose your own peace of mind. Hey, why should I lose my peace of mind? My happiness, you see, the moment I let anybody else affect my happiness, then it's my mistake. Nothing can happen to me that I do not permit. How do we deal with this difference, like in difference and opinions, like if there is no good and bad, there is some difference between attitude. The reason why the world has built hierarchies in the system. So in the hierarchy, the responsibility of the person who is with the senior position, the authority given to that person is, no matter what are the differences, his or her decision will prevail. You should see the armed forces, how they work. You know, before every battle, before every important battle, the senior commanding officer who may be a colonel, he will actually call a meeting of all the officers of that battalion, major, captain, lieutenants, everybody. And he will ask everybody to give free and frank opinion on how this battle should be conducted. And everybody puts in very, very firmly one's opinion. Even though it may differ completely from what they know the colonel to be thinking or whatever it is, they will come up with opinion. The colonel is supposed to listen to all, take a decision. But once the colonel takes a decision, it becomes everybody's decision. Now that is the difference between the army ethics and the common ethics. Suppose you are my boss and I plead very strongly with you. If you agree with me, I am happy. If you don't agree with me and take a decision which is opposed to what I say, aisa karta hai kya? Dekh So that means I will not put my heart in implementing your decision at all. I think that is wrong. And that is unethical. Because I don't have the authority to change something. You have the authority. If and when I get the authority, it is, authority means what? A responsibility given to me to take a decision. And there will be varying opinions. Now forget the other aspect. Even in engineering approach, you take any engineering problem, there, you put five engineers there, there will be at least three different opinions completely on how to solve a problem. That will happen in life. You have to live with it. So even in a team of equals, you always choose a team leader. Why? A team leader is not a notional relation. You say that appears to be the wiser amongst all of us. Let him or her take decisions. But then you have to follow those decisions, like in the armed force. There's no shortcut to that. Should you put someone else at harm or should you like sacrifice someone else for greater good? Because uh, uh, like, uh, it, has, it happens in daily life as well and it has happened in major situations like World War II. So what is your take on that? Because we have to like sometimes uh, sacrifice someone else's good for, uh, for the group, group, good of the group or something. Who am I to decide what is the general good which is better than the problem that you are facing? Who am I to decide? So who, who gives me 
that power, that authority, and more important than either, that wisdom to decide that, look, this is a much better good, it, for good for so many, this can only be achieved if I kill you. you know, these are hard questions. And let me also tell you, I mean, I am, by the way, a, a very, very ardent student of history and geography. The history of human development and the history of development of nation states should tell you a couple of things. The ambition of a nation state actually somehow represents the collective ambition of the whole group. And the ambition could be very, very destructive for other groups in the world. Second, there is absolutely no segment of a society in the last 10,000 years which has not been very cruel to some other segment of the society somewhere. So, if you really want it, every human being that you see, you should keep saying sorry, 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 because my ancestors did, did this. We talk of World War II. So, uh, I don't know whether you have read uh, Mahabharat, where an entire area was surrounded by Lord Krishna and Arjun, and not a single life was permitted to escape life. What was that? I mean, we respect Mahabharat, we respect Lord Krishna, but that was annihilation of the complete species. On what ma uh, ground did they justify it? Because that entire population of whatever people or whatever they lived there, they are considered harmful to the other society to which I belong. I think these are hard, hard questions and I hope that you never get to uh, get into a situation where you have to take such decisions. These are hard decisions. Trust in life is extremely important. But if you have you have very strong feelings about something, then I think those feelings will override anything else that you I mean, I have lived all my life with my tricolor as my god. There is no important god then. I used to be extremely perturbed when I could see young people going away for learning something elsewhere in the world is fine, but staying there and changing their nationality. When they change their nationality, they are actually owing an allegiance to a flag with which I may not have any fight today, but tomorrow if there is a fight. And if every human being from each nation state is enrolled to fight, even if it's my brother on the other side holding a rifle in his hand and I'm holding a rifle in my hand, I don't know whether he will shoot at me or not, but I will. Now, that is a very strong allegiance to one's nationhood. If you think logically, it appears nonsensical. Because each nation state is exactly like that. But if you look at the flow of history, <coughs> all the nation states behave in the way they do when they become not militarily powerful alone, but economically powerful. Uh, I would strongly recommend that you should read a book called Factfulness. It is written by Hans Rosling. He died of cancer. He actually has described the progress of the world using the United Nations data on the development. And he says that he has some questions which he asks. He says, tell me, they are, actually they are describing the state of the world. And he says most people answer 90% of the questions wrongly because their impression about the world he is based on the data which was 20 years old. Today's situation is different. You know, the average life expectancy in India was less than 45 years when we became independent. 70 years now. Bangladesh is supposedly a poor country. The average life expectancy there is 71 years. So, in spite of all the conundrum that you see, all the problems that you see, progress is being made. The economic fulcrum, he shows very clearly that it's shifting from United States to Europe to Asia. Within next 40 years, 60% of the richest people in the world will come from Asia, not from West or uh, West. Now, the, when this fulcrum changes, 
Perhaps the behavior of the nations here will also change. They will become as arrogant as the West has been. Now, this is, in a, in a minuscule way, this is exactly what could happen to an individual. I perhaps remain humble because I have nothing much. But if I become a very top-notch boss, if I become very rich, will I remain humble? And that is the test of humility. If I become arrogant, then my behavior will start troubling others around me. And when nations become arrogant, that is what happened to Germany. But that happens to every nation state. These are big problems. I'm luckily not in that position or business to decide. But I will tell you something. Ideally, the entire humanity should have a single system. It is easier said than done. Because even in a nation state, the individual provinces do not gel well with each other. And that's why I proudly say that India is such a phenomenal country. Look at the diversity we have. Umpteen languages, all major religions of the world, all ethnicities. And as an added attraction, we love to fight over each one of these issues. And yet, if India is threatened even a bit from outside, the same goddamn country unites. I remember when the Pokhran happened, uh, we were uh, <coughs> holidaying in Sikkim. Uh, in Gangtok, we were staying in a nondescript hotel. We did not have TVs in the room, so they had a hall in which the TV was kept. And there were about 50 people looking at the news from all over the country. There was one Sardarji, couple of Tamil, all kinds of... And when this news broke, that India has succeeded in establishing itself as a nuclear power, people actually stood up and clapped. Nobody knew each other. Now, that is what a nation is. And I think I'm very proud of my nation to that. I mean, Russia and the West are actually fighting. Ukraine is incident. I don't know whether you have, uh, how many of you have heard our foreign minister's reply to the European question when Jay Shankar was asked that uh, we expected uh, some noise to be heard from India. And Jay Shankar said that when Iraq and Afghanistan happened, we did not hear any noise from Europe. So I think those days are past where you expected all other countries to endorse whatever you did. Now, we are saying, well, you may be great, we may not be that great today, but we are good and we'll take care of ourselves. I think this, this will continue, God knows how long. I am 75 now, I will still be around for 25 more years, but you will be around for 75 more years. So you will have greater fun to witness. <laughs> Only thing is, take good care of yourself, take good care of your family, take good care of your friends take good care of your nation. That's the only thing you can do. Uh, should we follow our passion or go for job which uh, gets more paid? When I started, I started an IT business incubator uh, when I set up the school of IT, which is now merged with CS department. So that IT incubator was the forerunner of our site, Society of Innovation. Now, I was using the money given by Kamal Rekhi and Nandan Nilekani for doing all of these initiatives. I have studied the incubator models all over the world. They would typically charge a monthly rental for any startup company. So I decided we will charge 50,000 rupees a month. So in a year, people have to give 6 lakh rupees. We had umpteen applications, uh, some alumni, some students still, etc. One of the group of three came and they discussed, they explained this thing. And one of them said, sir, my father wants to meet you. I said, I, why your father? You know, he wants to meet you. I said, fine. Your father came next day. And he, he started on a very harsh tone. What are you doing? Uh, what happened? You know, he is going to get a degree from IIT. We are expecting him to do a good job. And this nonsense now he is talking about doing a startup and business. What is this? 
So I said, Arey Baba, I am not responsible. We are just inviting application to apply. No, no, you don't know. What if he fails? So I said, if he fails, doesn't matter. He has a B.Tech degree from IIT. He will get a good job later. But you are charging money. So I said, six lakh rupees, three of them. I think they should be able to take a loan of two lakh rupees each. And we, yeah, 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 he has talked to me like that. But that loan will sit on his head, no? I said, if he makes money in his business, he will earn much more than that. And if he doesn't, I said, he will get a job, as I said. He will be able to repay that. <laughs> then he came to the real problem. He says, Professor, I will tell you my worry. As you say, he wants to do this. He has this passion. Fine, let him do it. Do lakh rupees bhi koi mushkil nahi. But suppose he fails after six or eight months. As you say, he will get a job. But when he gets a job, he will still still have these two lakh rupees loan on his head. Who will marry him? So I I I said, excuse me. So he says in our biradari, the girl's parents will first look at the economic well-being of the prospective bridegroom. And doesn't so I said, but he has a B.Tech degree from IIT Bombay. He says doesn't matter <laughs> if he has two lakh rupees loan on his head, nobody will give him a girl for marriage. Now I had no reply, so I called Kamal in United States. I called Nandan in Bangalore, and I said I have a marriage problem. <laughs> They could not understand what the marriage problem was, so I explained to them, and they asked me, "So, what's your solution?" So I said, "My solution is, for the first year, I will make the facilities of the incubator free." So, what do you want us to do? So I said, "I don't want anything. You have donated enough money. Permit me to use some of that money as operational expenses for the next three years." I hope that within three years, people they very gladly said. So the incubator that we ran did not charge a single paisa because of this marriage problem. <laughs> what we wanted is that team did not get selected by there because I had only two cabins or two offices, so we could select only two in the first batch. One of them is Kashyap Devra, who has written a book, a very successful entrepreneur. He has become. Is written a book called Golden Tap. So pursuing your passion, whether it is for entrepreneurship or whether it is for certain profession, is of paramount importance. But sometimes the circumstances may not permit you to pursue that passion. For example, in your college, I do not know if your father goes to the director, says that he is going to get married. The director will say, "Okay, Baba, take a job." The more important element in all of this is you. Now you should decide what is more important for you. If your passion is more important, and you are willing to take the risk, and if you are willing to face the downside, go ahead with the passion. So that is what is most important. But if you think you want to follow a safe route, follow that safe. The only thing that I will advise you is. At this crossroad, or in any other crossroad in life, wherever you have to choose one path, go either this way or that way. Once you choose that path, don't ever go back and question your decision, because in every path you will have problems and you will have opportunities. And you, if you succeed, it will be all right. But if you don't succeed, you should not curse yourself. Say, "Look, at that time. If I had not done this, life would have been different." Not necessarily. So the best thing is never re-examine the decision that you are. Take your decision with all your logical might, all your might or heart. Decide what you want to do. Once you take a decision, then whatever happens, never question your own decision. So never walk back in time. That is very harmful. Go ahead. And think okay, failures will happen. As I said, 24 hours. You see the morning sun next day and say, uh, "Let me start something." So my question is, as a science student. We all have some some type of logical thinking, and uh, we think always logical. But if we just go to the spirituality, then we don't find something logical. Then, but we have a tendency of thinking like that. But uh, what we should do for that? You should learn to discern between problems which require logical thinking and logical solution, and problems which are not essentially logic based. 
human relationship is one such problem where logic cannot be applied because that is based on an emotional fulcrum which is completely different so for a friend or for my mother i may do crazy things which i would never logically think of doing because they are important to me as individuals as long as you distinguish between the two and keep doing good things either way is fine but i i personally feel that treating everything as a logical problem is incorrect because we are all human beings and human interactions are often governed emotionally they are not governed logically so you so you just now said that uh, that human relationships are emotional and should be not thought of logical logically and you also told that being humble uh, being humble concerned and courtesy are main important things but the point is sometimes these things uh, make you think uh, means you are uh, good to other people but other people take advantage of you and think you as fools so sir how to deal with that solution how to uh, bring the logic part that that is that is where the intelligent tactfulness in you should be used the message that your action should give is you are being nice does not mean that you are weak you are being nice does not mean that people can take you for granted you are being nice does not mean that you will always listen to others you have your opinions strong opinions to convey that decently is the challenge but i tell you you will be able to do that so remember two things always as a professional you have to take correct professional decisions and move forward and in that process if somebody says something different you shouldn't care because that is your professional belief as a person you must remain humble internally and you must remain humble externally but humility should not be confused with weakness now that's it's not easy to balance the moment you feel that people around you are taking you to be a buffoon then you should perhaps uh temper your humility a little bit and show them what you are but as long as you do that only to demonstrate your strength and you don't permit that to become your habit the second one is dangerous first one is that. that's the beauty of life you know knowledge always transfers both ways people wrongly assume that teachers teachers students learn that is nonsense most of my most useful things in my life i have learned from my students and from questions like this because they trigger your thinking further so don't hesitate in raising questions thank you for good questions